Hi, my name is Billy Jo Underwood and I'm the Baldwin County Commissioner from District 3. I'm here today with Sheriff Hoss Mack for him to share some of the history of his family and Baldwin County, especially in the Central Baldwin area. Hi, Sheriff. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Good to be with you today. Good Thank to see you, you for today. having me. Absolutely. As we know, your hometown of Robertsdale is mm -hmm. celebrating their 100 year centennial. Yes. And we are doing some history videos of some of the families who have been in the area. Mm -hmm. So tell me about when your family came to the Central Baldwin Robertsdale area. Absolutely. Um, we moved to Baldwin County from Atmore, Alabama in August of 1965. Uh, just prior to that, my father and mother uh, had purchased a home in Robertsdale. It was that time it was referred to as the Old Baldwin Home. It was built by the uh, Baldwin family and it was vacant at the time. And my dad uh, was basically recruited by three businessmen in Robertsdale to build a funeral home in Robertsdale. So he started renovations in April of 1965. We moved in in August of 65 and opened the business in October and it's been in business ever since. So the old Baldwin home is in the current where the funeral home is on Highway 59, right right in the middle of that town? Is, that is correct. In fact, if you look at the home itself, the two-story portion mm -hmm. was the original home. That was a Sears and Roebuck home that they actually ordered from Sears and Roebuck in Chicago. It was a prefab home. It was brought by rail to Robertsdale in 1910 and it took a year to build that home. So the home was actually finished in 1911. That is really amazing. I have heard of these Sears and Roebuck homes. I think there's a few located in other parts of the county. Mm -hmm. And to, to know that, I believe the l and Railroad was just not far to the east behind where the, the funeral home sits today. Is that right? That's correct. It's about 300 yards behind the funeral home was the rail bed. And they actually used, they actually put the walls on logs and pulled it by horse over to the location before they erected it. And have you guys been able to preserve some of those unique characteristics of the old Sears and Roebuck area? I know we only get to see when you walk in the very front, Sure. but is some of the back of it still have all of the uniqueness that those old homes had? I know they had a lot of unique mm -hmm. wood and things like that. So the fireplaces are all original. Okay. Those were the original fireplaces. Uh, and then uh, upstairs is the beaded ceiling. Uh, all the beaded ceilings are still original up there. But probably one of the things that stands out most is the staircase. Uh, the staircase that's in the center of the funeral home that goes upstairs is all mahogany. Even the painted wood was mahogany. And uh, that's all the original staircase. And then there are the original, there was a, we always called it the, uh, the secret room, if you will. But there was a room underneath that staircase, and that is still all of the original wood. It's never even been painted or touched since it was built in 1911. So tell me how your dad liked being in Robertsdale when he first came there. He loved it. We, uh, Mom and Dad fell in love with the community immediately. Um, they were, I've said, there was three businessmen, uh, Percy Pearson, Raymond Fell, and Jimmy Gilbert. And they were three people in Robertsdale that reached out to my dad. And then a fourth person became involved who was actually the owner of the home, Michael Baldwin. And so those four guys really mentored my dad into the business. They embraced us. And I can remember, you know, we had bridge clubs that met at the house with my mother and all the type of community events that we were involved in. And so uh, being close to the school, being close to Hammond Supermarket, we were really right in the middle of town, if you will. Yes. And uh, it was a very exciting time as Robert Steele was growing. Well, they always say that's one of the professions that you're going to always have a need for. That's correct. <laughs> and so we are thankful that you have been able to serve the community. I know my family and many of the people from the area have uh, been grateful for the mm -hmm. service that has been provided there. So tell me about growing up and how, how it was like growing up in a funeral home. Well, it was actually, it, a lot of people, you know, you can imagine it was very unique. We lived upstairs. So in the original configuration of the house, all of the, um, uh, the kitchen and the original living quarters were all downstairs and you had bed, just the bedrooms were upstairs. So it had to be remodeled because the bottom floor became the business and the top floor. So uh, we lived in a, in a two bedroom, one bath is what we had upstairs. And uh, at night uh, when we would have wakes and things of that nature in the funeral home, uh, my, me and my sister both, we had to be very quiet upstairs because they could hear us moving around upstairs and we didn't want to make them think that it was something else moving around up there uh, than, than what it actually was. 
And uh, so we all worked in the business. I went to work in the business when I was probably about 11 years old. I uh, started working there. Uh, my sister worked in it for a short period before she went off to college. And uh, so it was it was a different growing up, but it, I wouldn't have changed it for the world. Um, it was where I got to meet, as you can imagine, being an 11-year-old helping uh, his father out in a business. I met people from the community, so I knew people that were 50, 60 years older than me because I met them, and I just had a, a I guess you could say, a, a gravity towards a lot of the people in the community because of the exposure that we had in owning a funeral home. Absolutely. Sort of like... Um what I think about my, when you have these type of family businesses and to see them be able to survive over the generations. Mm -hmm. So when did you change and decide you weren't going to follow directly in your dad's footsteps? So I know your wife is still there, right? right? But I guess it probably started in about 1978. Um, in 1978, uh, Dr. Davis was the coroner of Baldwin County and Dr. Davis resigned. And um, the governor had to, Governor Wallace, uh, had to appoint a coroner for Baldwin County. My dad had kind of helped Dr. Davis out a little bit. So in 1979, uh, George Wallace, uh, the governor at the time, appointed my father to be coroner of Baldwin County. So I started assisting a little bit with that part of it as well as the funeral home. Another thing, the second factor that kind of got me to where I'm at now, uh, back then we didn't have cell phones. And so my dad had a telephone in the garage at the funeral home. And so the local sheriffs, the police department, if they were ever in the area and they needed to stop and use a telephone, they could stop and use that phone because they knew it was there rather than having to go all the way to the police station or to another location. So my dad had a rule. And that rule was that any police car or any sheriff's car that came on the property did not leave the property without being washed. And so I started washing the cars and things of that nature. And then finally, in 1982, uh, which was the year I graduated high school, uh, my grandfather was murdered. Uh, he was murdered in Escambia County in a little community just very near here to where we are in Baymanette called McCullough. And he owned a little country convenience store, a lot like what you have seen on the Waltons. And uh, he was murdered, and there was a big investigation into that. The individual that committed the robbery and murder, of course, was apprehended. But I, I kind of gravitated a little bit, both from a personal side and a little bit of a professional side in what went on in that investigation. And so in 1985, I started my career out with the Department of Forensic Sciences in Mobile. Awesome. So what is your actual degree when you went to college and you went to Troy? Yes. Okay. I actually started here, uh, graduated Robert Stowe High School. Uh, I came at that time, uh, Faulkner State, Okay. and I uh, came to Faulkner State. Two years I had uh, my degree in criminal justice. Mm -hmm. I then went to Troy and uh, I actually triple majored uh, at the time. I guess you could say I was conflicted about what I was going to do. So I was majoring in counseling, I was majoring in criminal justice, and then uh, something that uh, you certainly know a lot more than me about, but I majored in financial accounting. Awesome. And uh, so I got my degree from Troy, and then 10 years later, while working, I ended up going back to Troy and getting my master's in management. Well, that's impressive to know that you have, it, it's important, you know, I'm going to be an advocate for business degrees because no matter what profession you're in, counting is the language of business. Right. And so that, I'm sure that has really helped you in your career of the little bit that you, you know, um, probably learned in college and been able to enhance that. So tell me about the early days of coroner in Baldwin County and kind of compare it to where we've come today. Sure. So uh, once again, back in the late 70s, um, there in the state level, there was before the Department of Forensic Sciences, there was what was known as the State Department of Toxicology and Criminal Investigation. And so all the physical examinations of the bodies, those were the victims of homicide, suicide, accident, they did not have a laboratory anywhere in South Alabama. So what they did is they utilized the funeral homes in the area to do those examinations. So that's how I was getting that exposure because they were doing it. Our funeral home was the funeral home in Baldwin County that was designated to those examinations. In 1979, they changed to the Alabama Department of Forensic Sciences. The first medical examiner that was hired for the state of Alabama was hired for the Mobile office. His name was Dr. Leroy Riddick. 
and Dr. Riddick had previously been a medical examiner in New York City and in Washington, D.C. But he was originally from the state of Mississippi. He was a southern boy. And while he was up there, he always had a goal that at the pinnacle of his career, he wanted to come back to the South, and he wanted to help establish a medical examiner system and a forensic system in the South. So he ended up in Mobile, and Dr. Riddick was the one that hired me to go to work for the Department of Forensic Sciences, and I worked there for five years before I came with the Sheriff's Office. So in 1980, 1985, the coroner's office was probably averaging 30, 40 cases a year, uh, most of which were accidents, motor vehicle accidents, farming accidents, because mm -hmm. we had a lot of agriculture back then. And then all the way up to now, if you look at it in 2021, where they're now averaging somewhere of 500 cases yes. a year. And that's just how much, once again, the coroner's office has had to grow to keep up with the pace of the number of people we have living here in our county. Well, if you do the comparison, our population has tripled since the 1980s, but the number of coroner cases has about multiplied many, many more times than that. That's correct. So having that experience really helps you with what you, you do now. Mm -hmm. And with your family being a victim of violent crime, with your grandfather being murdered, mm -hmm. I know that that is really probably giving you more of a passion to help others. And um, I know that we have a lot of, um, a lot of people in Baldwin County still consider this to be a very safe place to live. Right. I consider it a very safe place to mm -hmm. live. And that's one of the things that we hope to continue. And that's we great. appreciate all that you're doing to help with that. Mm -hmm. Tell me something about, since this is for history purposes, tell me something about the central Baldwin area that really stands out to you besides the funeral home portion that you were dealing with that you really love about your hometown of Robertsdale. I think, you know, one of the things I always go back to, Hammond's Supermarket, Hammond's Store. Um, at that time, Hammond's had actually, it was a new location on Highway 59. It had actually originated up on Chicago Street, uh, close to where Campbell Hardware is mm -hmm. now. And so Pop Hammond uh, had built Hammond's Store. And in Hammond's Store, you had um, uh, one of his, his daughter-in-law actually had a little cafe. It was called Lois's Cafe, Grady Hill, had a little barber shop inside Hammond's supermarket. And then uh, there was, a, of course, a, the full supermarket. They cut their own meat and everything. And so Pop, as everybody called him, Pop Hammond, he would gather the local kids. And when I say kids, we're talking 10 to 12 years old. And he would let us come in and bag groceries for tips. And so we would come over there and we would bag groceries for the ladies and everything, take the groceries to the car and unload them in the car. And, you know, Little did we know, and who would have thought about it, but if you think about it, Hammond's store was really kind of a precursor to what you see in a Walmart now. Yes. Uh, you know, Walmarts have subways, they have optical shops and things of that nature. But one of the things I really appreciated about Robertsdale, and I just use that one example, so community oriented. I mean, you, 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 you shopped with these people, you went to church with these people, you went to school with these people. Everything was about the community. And it was so community involved. And I think Robert Stell has still uh, withheld a lot of that. Uh, but it was so richer back then uh, with everything that we had. And that's always been one of the things I love to talk about, you know, because and everybody had, you know, if it was summertime, you worked on the potato shed. If it was wintertime, you bagged groceries at Pop Hammond's. Uh, after school, you would walk over to the library and you would do the things there. So it really was a, a great experience growing up in Robertsdale. It's truly one of the small town um, USA type that you would see on the Andy Griffith Show yes, or something like that. So tell me about some of the other extracurricular activities that you loved about Robertsdale. Did you? Um, I know there's a lot of rodeo going mm -hmm. on there, and that's really the only portion of Baldwin County that really shines in that arena. Would you think so? I mean, no pun intended. <laughs> well, and, and, and of course, where it really started, once again, the Coliseum in mm -hmm. Robertsdale and the Baldwin County Fair. So the Baldwin County Fair, uh, when it was originally over on uh, Palmer Street, uh, where the softball parks are now, uh, the Baldwin County Fair was huge. That was a big deal. The fair would last seven to ten days. Uh, and, and in the, the fair, and you only see a portion of it now, but you had all the baked goods, ladies, you know, they're, they're crocheting, they're knitting, they would quilt. 
All these things were entered into competitions. You literally had hundreds of people participating in all these little individual competitions. Plus you had the fairway, uh, the fair, of course, all the food and the vendors and things that would come. Well, as the fair began to grow, they started looking for different ways to kind of attract more people in. So the rodeo as we know it now, which is actually going to be held in just a couple weeks in Robertsdale, was started by the Robertsdale Rot Rotary Club. And so they partnered with Sonny Hankins uh, and George Campbell uh, at the Coliseum to bring the rodeo to Robertsdale. And so the first rodeo that we had, and I believe this will be Robertsdale Rotary's 22nd year. Okay. And I was a member of that Rotary Club at the time, but we started the rodeo at the Coliseum as an addition to the fair. And here 22 years later, it's actually the only rodeo uh, that is held by a, um, a civic organization like Rotary in the southeast. Now we also have the Foley Rodeo, mm -hmm. which is put on by the Jennifer Claire Moore Foundation. Right. But it's a little bit different, so our rodeo has always been very special in Robertsdale. Yes, and Robertsdale has a few famous people from Robertsdale that have went on into that career. And I think from talking to some of them, it's rare to have those from our part of the, the country. So yes. I'm glad to see that Robertsdale is continuing that tradition. Mm -hmm. So tell me about some of the agricultural aspects as far as the, the cattlemen's and the livestock. Um, sales area that was there not far from where you live, right. just a block away, I believe. Um, and your family's been involved in some of that? Yes, so the Robertsdale Livestock Auction mm -hmm. uh, for many years, and uh, my father-in-law, Jimmy Racine, uh, was on uh, the uh, original board of directors for mm -hmm. the Robertsdale Livestock. And so once again, you had, your you had your sales, which would always be on Mondays. But you, back then, the sales would last 24 to 48 hours. So they would sell not only beef cattle, but they sold hogs, and occasionally they would sell horses. And so they actually had adjacent to the livestock auction was another business started by uh, my, uh, my brother-in-law's father. His name was Sardine Mosley, and it was called the Robertsdale Locker Plant, which is now where Farm Fresh Meats is. So you could literally go into the Robertsdale Livestock Auction, buy a cow, they would bring it over to the Robertsdale Locker Plant, slaughter that cow, and process that cow, and then you could take it home. Wow. So there was a lot, and they did that not only for individuals, but they did it commercially. It was a very big business uh, back in the 60s and the 70s. And that's actually how I, I never forget one of the interesting stories. I was a kid, I was probably six or seven years old. And where the funeral home was, we could literally sit on the porch and we could listen to the auctioneer at night as he was auctioning off the cattle. And so we would go out there and listen to him. And you know, so one morning I had gotten up, I think I was getting ready. I walked to school back then and had got up and I saw this guy on a horse coming down the middle of Highway 59. And some cows had gotten out, which routinely would happen. And uh, they had gotten out. Well, lo and behold, that was George Campbell. And that was the first time I ever met George Campbell. He was riding his horse down the middle of Highway 59 trying to rope a cow. So, wow, he's like, the Marlboro man. That's right, he was, <laughs> absolutely he was. But once again, a, a lot of us would go over as a part-time job, we would have sort cattle. So they would get over there after school and we were very much the FFA, I uh, was very much involved in FFA in high school. And so all of us would go over after school on a Monday afternoon and sort cattle. And sometimes we would be over there till way in the early morning hours of Tuesday morning, only to go to school at eight o'clock. I'm only a couple of years behind you in age, and I do remember passing by, and you, you knew when the livestock was there because mm -hmm. there was a distinct odor in the yeah, air, yeah. but that's that good odor, you know what I that's mean? Right. It's like, you know what, it's like farming and the culture that we have there in, in Baldwin County. Tell me about growing up at the Robertsdale schools and, and how they have changed, but how mm -hmm. you enjoyed um, your time there. Well, Robertsdale, even back then, uh, you had the feeder pattern of Robertsdale, which at that time was Loxley, Silver Hill, Elsinore, and Rosington. Those were the schools that fed in. So there was only about one-fifth or less of the kids that went to Robertsdale all 12 years. So I was one of those. I went to Robertsdale all 12 years. I started in the first grade all the way through the 12th. And, of course, everything was one campus, uh, Robertsdale Elementary and Robertsdale High School was all one campus. So you might be friends with a teacher that you weren't going to 
have for another 10 years as a teacher because we all shared the same cafeteria, we all shared the same gymnasium, we all shared the same grounds and everything. And so I got to know, of course, Virgil Buck was probably the first principal that I knew, and then Bobby Ferris, who was a good friend of mine, uh, Bob, Robert King, uh, that was there, Paul McKinney, all those different ones. And so I got to be good friends because I spent 12 years on mm -hmm. the same campus. And whereas now, you know, our, our children are going multiple campuses and everything. So that was a rich experience for me. I still main con maintain contact with some of my teachers and some of my coaches to this day. I, I know you have some special coaches in your life yes. uh, that you had at Foley. But uh, I still uh, keep in touch with some of those ladies and gentlemen and everything who had a great impact on my life. Yeah, it's so rewarding to be able to stay in the community and to be able to um, go back and give back and see. Right. I am so thankful, and I'm sure you are as well, of the ones who have educated us. Mm -hmm. There are so many things that we take for granted, and I am so thankful to be a product of our Baldwin County Board of Education. Absolutely. So what kind of activities did you participate in school that so uh, I played football. I played football and basketball. I played basketball until the sport outgrew me. Uh, everybody got taller than me. Uh, so I, I learned to get out of basketball. I never really was a baseball player, uh, but I did play football from a very young age all the way through high school. I was very involved in it. I was a member of Youth for Christ, YFC that we had. I was able to help start the first Interact Club, which is a division of Rotary at Robertsdale. I was president of the Future Farmers of America for a couple years. I was on the livestock judging team, uh, very proud of that. Uh, we made it all the way to the finals at the state level and we got beat by a four girl team from Auburn High School and we were crushed. Uh, <laughs> our egos were diminished forever because uh, we thought that we had that. But it was a very good experience. Uh, Eddie Creamer was our ag teacher and just, uh, just probably added so much to so many lives that was there. Uh, and then uh, served on the yearbook staff, wrote articles for the yearbook, and uh, I just really loved being at school. I, I, I told my uh, children when they were growing up, and both I was very proud, both of our sons attended Robertsdale High School. And you know, all kids go through that portion of school where I, you know, I hate school and everything. I told them, I said, I'd go back in a minute. I said, I'd love to go back and spend a few weeks back at high school, the high school that we were in. So those were some of the activities that I was involved in. I recently was um, had the honor of um, judging the Robert's Tale Sweetheart pageant mm -hmm. and got to um, meet some of the young girls that are there today, and I was so impressed with um, with that generation. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes we, we get, I guess, people try to change our image of what what's out there with our youth, and there's some great people in Robertsdale, and the reason I'm bringing this up was in the interview process, there was a young lady who said she had come from a, another school, and she'd been at Robertsdale for two or three years, and she said, I have never been to a community that was so kind and nice and open. Mm -hmm. And I was so happy to hear that with all yep. that's going on in the world. So you were very blessed to have been able to be a part of that Absolutely. school. And I know that with your children there, and I'm sure your future generations all mm -hmm. be a part of it. So tell me, what do you see um, as some of the challenges that your community has faced and how they've overcome them? Um, with with um, the, the, the growth that you've had in the, the Robertsdale and the Central Baldwin community? I think particularly in Central Baldwin County, uh, you know, of course, everything in Baldwin County is affected by growth, and it has been, I want to say, really, I think Hurricane Frederick was probably one of the first initiators of growth, and I remember that uh, in the late 1970s when Frederick came through because Frederick just changed the landscape so much, not only of Gulf Shores and Orange Beach, but also of, of a lot of the agricultural areas and stuff in the county. So since that time, I think with the growth, uh, the, the transition from being agricultural to residential, um, you know, I can remember just hundreds if not thousands of acres being farmed and grazed. Uh, I can remember cattle drives in Rosington. Uh, I can remember, you know, picking corn. I can remember working on the potato shed. And unfortunately, you don't see those things anymore because we have a lot less agriculture. And with the change in that industry, it really kind of transformed where people weren't working on the farms anymore. They weren't working locally. They were working further away. They were going to Pensacola. They were going to Mobile. 
And now we've kind of seen the reverse because now just about any job you want to pursue, you can pursue in Baldwin County. We have so many opportunities here, both in tech and industry and service. And so it's, it's kind of like you see this, it comes around and it keeps coming back. But I think one of the things in, in Central Baldwin as well as some other communities in our county, they still hang on and maintain that community spirit. And that's what's important. So we have grown, we have changed a lot, but I still think we maintain a lot of that community spirit. That's great. And we have a, a lot of great churches in Robertsdale. And I know recently the church you attend and that you're a member of celebrated their 100 year anniversary, which kind of coincides with the cities. Yes. It's, it's just a coincidence. Yep. Tell me about your um, church in Robertsdale, the United Methodist Church. So when we moved from Atmore, uh, it was kind of a unique thing. My father grew up Primitive Baptist and my mother grew up Presbyterian. And my mother was actually from upstate New York and her and dad had met in so Florida. So your mom's a Yankee. She was a Yankee. <laughs> she was lived, she came from a little community called Gloversville, New York, which is north of Albany. And she ended up in Florida where she met my dad who was working at a funeral home down there. She was a laboratory technician. And uh, they got married anyway, ended up back in Atmore and then eventually to Robertsdale. And so uh, they were looking for a church, and it just so happened, of course, the Methodist church is literally 100 yards from the funeral home. Almost in the parking lot. <laughs> that's right, and, and my parents had a rule. There were two rules that involved church. One, whenever the church was open, you were there. Yep. And two, you dressed up for church. And so I can, in fact, I can remember probably the first time I walked into a church and all the men didn't have ties on, I was kind of held back. But uh, so we became, we joined little, when we moved to, Robertsdale in 1965, my parents joined the Methodist Church. And then in 1976, 1974, 1974, I joined the church and I've been a member at Robertsdale United Methodist ever since. Wow, that's amazing. There's not many people that can say they've been a member of a congregation for that long. How did your dad get involved in the funeral home business? Was, was that something that he went into or was that something your family had been involved in? He actually, my dad uh, went to, back then McCullough had a high school. They no longer have a high school. And then, so they were based on credit hours. So my dad actually had enough credit hours to graduate high school as a junior. So he finished high school and his intent was to go to the University of Alabama, go to school at the University of Alabama and become a doctor. He was going to go to medical school. And in fact, uh, recently we've had kind of another legend that has passed here in Baldwin County, that being of Red Wilkins. Well, Red Wilkins and my dad were actually roommates. Uh, for a very short period of time when my dad went to the university. And the reason I say a short period of time, my dad got to the university, uh, went up there, he was there for one semester, kind of got acclimated to the whole college life and everything. Of course, this is in the early 1950s. And he was going through that and he went to register for his second semester, got his classes, and I think he met with a school counselor and they were kind of talking about what are you going to do, what are you going to major in, what's your field. And when my dad found out it was going to take so long to become a doctor, he said, my dad did not have the patience for that. So he decided that uh, he had knew the funeral director in Atmore. Mm -hmm. He came back and got a part-time job working at the funeral home and decided that that's what he wanted to do. So there was no school for mortuary science in the southeast at that time. So he ended up going to Dallas, Texas. Uh, he graduated a program out there. Uh, from the Gupton Jones Institute for Funeral Service and he actually they hired him as an anatomy instructor mm. and so he worked as an anatomy instructor for a couple years and he met a guy that was coming through the school that knew of a job opening in Florida in Winter Haven, Florida. So he went back with him, went to Winter Haven, Florida, went to work for a funeral home there Back then, all the funeral homes, as a sideline, ran ambulance services. So most of the ambulance services were run by also by funeral homes. And so uh, he was working ambulance, and he went to the hospital in Winter Haven, and he met this laboratory technician uh, that was working at the hospital, who was my mother. And so that's where they met, and they got married. And then when he had the opportunity to come back home to Atmore, that's how we ended up coming back up here. Well, that is neat. I'm so thankful that we can do these living history videos because 
so much of that gets lost. Oh, yeah. And Absolutely. we are losing some of our, I know you miss your father mm -hmm. and your mother. Mm -hmm. And just like you mentioned, Red Wilkins just passed away. These iconic legends of people who were stood tall in Baldwin County, right. literally Red stood tall. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, once we, we lose that, we don't know that. I think that is so fascinating about your dad. Mm -hmm. um, tell me anything you would like to tell me about the time when you were working for the Sheriff's Department and how all that has evolved and changed to the point to time where you're now been the sheriff in the county. Mm -hmm. And tell me what you think is, has been some of the most memorable things um, that have stood out to you about those things. So in 1989, um, literally we were working a officer involved shooting that had occurred in Mobile. And I was working for the state at the time and I had come over, uh, they had ended up they be in the sheriff's office and uh, a couple other agencies had shot and killed the suspect in the Bell Forest community uh, off County Road 54. And Sheriff Jimmy Johnson was the sheriff mm -hmm. at the time and I had known Jimmy my entire life, uh, literally. And um, so I had come over and I was working the crime scene and everything and they actually had to fly me in by helicopter to where this had taken place because it was a very deep wooded area. So we go in, we work everything, we come back out and Sheriff Johnson is standing on the side of the road. Of course, he came up and we were talking. And he looked at me and he said, Hoss, he said, you know, you ought to come to work with the sheriff's office and, and not, you know, come back to Baldwin County. So that was in April of 1985. And by October, I was working with the sheriff's office. So I came to work with the sheriff's office in 1985, uh, 1989, excuse me, 1989. And then when I came to work in 1989, there were probably 30 deputies. Um, the jail probably housed about 120 people, uh, maybe a little bit more. And so the progression has been as not only in the growth of the number of people, but traffic has become the biggest issue in law enforcement. Uh, you know, back then Highway 59 was a two-lane road. Uh, I can remember as a kid growing up in Robertsdale on a Sunday, of course, back then we had a lot of blue laws that were in effect. Businesses were not allowed to be open on Sundays. And I could get on my bicycle in Robertsdale on Highway 59. People just find this totally imaginable now. But I could ride all the way from our funeral home to where St. Patrick's is now. Mm -hmm. And there was a bridge up there called the Old Vidoc that actually crossed over the railroad. And uh, I, would I forgot about that. I would, it was. I would ride up to the Vidoc because that was a big play area for kids up there and never see a vehicle. Wow. You know, never see a vehicle. Just anything you would like to share about your family, about your experiences, because this is the opportunity to let the people know these types of information will be lost forever if we don't tell the story. Well, one of the things, and I made mention a minute ago about how Baldwin County has really evolved now that you can pursue any career. Mm -hmm. uh, my sister, who's a few years older than me, uh, you know, she worked for Faulkner for years. She went to work at, at Faulkner, then Faulkner State, then, you know, uh, they changed their names. Now they're Coastal Alabama. But she pursued a career there and she had everything that she wanted. It was a wonderful working environment. My wife, Sherry, as you said, uh, grew up here, went to Robertsdale, ended up graduating from South Alabama, but manages the family funeral home now and has for years. Both of my sons are employed in Baldwin County. One works for a construction company, the other one is a police officer at one of our local municipalities. And so one of the things I've really, we're very blessed that I have all my family right here. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things, I have a lot of friends that were my age or a little older, and those families, that their children had to pursue careers away from here. Yes. But now we're seeing them come back, and they're mm -hmm. coming back to Baldwin County, and their children are now pursuing careers, and they have the opportunity that's here and so they're able to stay here. And so uh, one of the things I think that's very significant about that is we're still a, a I think, a faith-based community. Mm -hmm. uh, I still think we have strong values in Baldwin County. And I think that people are really starting to realize how important those things are. And I think now we're, we knew it because mm -hmm. we grew up in an area and, and during an era that that was just normal life. It right. was just the way that it was. But now people are starting. I hired two deputies yesterday. Mm -hmm. Both of them were not from Baldwin County. And so I always ask them, I go, why? Why do you want to leave where you are? Why do you want to come here? 
One of them told me, said, Sheriff, I just heard how great it was. I mean, that was his words. He said, I just heard how great it was. And so he said, this is where I want to come. This is where I want to live and raise a family and work. And so I think that's really what makes us the jewel in Baldwin County that we are. Tell me a little bit about the, you, you mentioned how the jail was very small back mm -hmm. then. I remember being the first time I got a tour of the jail. I wasn't brought to jail <laughs> as an as a, um, inmate. It was in the seventh grade mm -hmm. and um, our class brought us up here on a field trip. Tell me how that has evolved and where we stand today. So at that time, you probably would have only had what is the uh, jail portion that is on 3rd Street. Right. And there was not what we commonly refer to as Tower A, which mm -hmm. was built in 1995. So from the 1980s, uh, there was a construction in the late 1980s. Uh, Baldwin County Sheriff's Office was actually under a consent decree at the time by the federal courts because our jail was so old. Oh, we were in trouble. And we were in trouble. <laughs> we were and, in trouble. And we were in trouble, and that was under, and Sheriff Benton, Thomas Buck Benton uh, from Bond Secure, uh, Sheriff Benton started the program to renovate the jail and bring it up to current uh, regulations, which he did, under Sheriff Johnson's administration, and Sheriff Johnson was sheriff for 20 years. Sheriff Johnson was able to build Tower A, mm -hmm. was able to remodel the building that we're sitting in today, which this was actually the old Baymanette Police Department and then was able to build on addition on the third street. So that got us up to about a 650 bed population from a 150 bed population back in the 1980s. Then uh, what we're doing now in order to meet the needs, uh, we're currently doing another renovation and we'll be building Tower B. Tower B will be an additional 400 beds. So that's going to get us, by the time this construction is completed, somewhere probably around 2025 uh, is what we're thinking, maybe 2024. Um, we will be up somewhere between 950 and 1,000 beds that we'll have here. It's hard to believe, but we're the fifth largest sheriff's office now in the state, and that will put us at the fourth largest jail in the state. Well, Sheriff, this is a very nice uh, facility, mm -hmm. and uh, it's great to hear how it has all evolved. Tell me about some of the stuff that's in this office that is so unique and particularly to you. I look behind me and I see a really nice case full of challenge coins. Mm -hmm. And okay, naive me, my first one that I received was only about four years ago when somebody shook my hand and put one in my hand and I'm like, what's that? So tell me about all your experiences and what's your most, what's your favorite one that you've received? <laughs> so challenge coins actually started with the United States military. And it was a way that individuals from different units would greet each other. So if you were in an artillery unit and you met up with an infantry unit or whatever, you would always, you could greet them with a challenge coin. And the way, the proper way to pass a challenge coin is you would put it in the palm of your hand, you would shake, shake hands, hands and transfer And then you it. had it, yeah. Now the back side of that was, is if you didn't, if a person gave you a challenge coin and you did not have a challenge coin to give them in return, you had to buy them a drink. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> so that's where it came from. So law enforcement evolved into the challenge coin. So what you see behind me, those are challenge coins from every law enforcement agency in Baldwin County, a lot of our state and federal law enforcement. Uh, there's some very unique ones up there. I do have some military challenge coins. And one of the ones that if you'll actually look about on the fourth row there in the center, uh, you'll see kind of an oval one that has Truman on it. That is from the USS Truman. Uh, we got to actually a former Baldwin County Commissioner. Is and that I, an aircraft carrier? Yes, it was an aircraft carrier. We went on a program. We're very supportive of the military. We actually have 80 veterans or reservists that work in the Sheriff's Office. One year, the Commissioner and I got invited to go out to the USS Harry Truman, an aircraft carrier in the Atlantic, to watch night operations. And they were actually preparing for a deployment to the Indian Sea. And so we got to go out, and that was probably one of the most special challenge coins uh, that I had from there. Uh, then just some other memorabilia, just law enforcement. I, I did have the opportunity to uh, serve as past president of the Alabama Sheriff's Association in 2014. Uh, that's recognition there. Uh, the eagle that's behind me, um, that is actually, uh, I'm an Eagle Scout. And for several years, I presided over what's known as the Eagle Banquet, uh, which uh, helps out with raising funds for Boy Scouts of America, and I was presented that. And then uh, uh, the other item over there, you'll see a flag, um, very uh, 
interesting story behind that. Uh, when Sherry and I first got married, we lived in Daphne, and we lived in a little community still there called Plantation Hills. And uh, there was a young man that grew up across the street from us, and he was uh, a kid. And, uh, and of course, we were married. We didn't have any children of our own at the time. And he would come over from time to time, and I'd spend time with him, and we'd pitch and throw ball out in the yard. Fast forward 25, 30 years, he ends up going into the military and served in Afghanistan. And he flew that flag over one of the compounds in Afghanistan in my honor. And uh, when he came back to the United States, he gave that flag to me. And of course, that flag, it was actually flown in remembrance of 9-11. And he knew that I had spent some time in New York following 9-11, so he put together that whole package for me so that I could have that. Well, that is a great memory. What is over on these other walls? Let's see. So uh, just some uh, other things that we've uh, kind of collected through the years. I'm a big history buff, and so probably one of the most unique things you're going to see over there is a sword. Uh, and that sword is a uh, traditional Scottish sword from the time of the 1300s and of course most people will remember that as being the time of the movie Braveheart yes. uh, which depicted the life of William Wallace. My heritage is Scottish and so I was fortunate enough that I actually did the research. We came from a community uh, just south of Edinburgh. Uh, our clan name is spelled H-U-M-E but it's pronounced home so it was clan home uh, and my ancestors left Scotland uh, following the wars of the 13 and 1400s, ended up migrating to Ireland, left Ireland after a period of time and ended up in Connecticut, uh, came down through the eastern United States over a period of years, and I had an ancestor that fought with Andrew Jackson at the Battle of New Orleans. Following the Battle of New Orleans, all the soldiers received land grants that they could have land. So he went back to South Carolina and was going to go with his family, his brothers, to move to Louisiana. They got into uh, north of Escambia County and in Conecuh County on the trip to Louisiana and my great-great-great-grandfather said, I'm done, I'm not going anymore. So he settled there. The other side of the family did go on to Louisiana and they settled in the Denham Springs area in Louisiana. Then my great-great-grandfather ended up fighting in the Civil War. And uh, he uh, was an enlisted. Uh, he ended up being killed at the Battle of Stones River, also referred to as the Battle of Murfreesboro in Tennessee. And so he, he was uh, killed at that battle. So, but back to the sword, that's our family tartan. Uh, a tartan is a piece of quilt material that is, has the different colors, and that is the official tartan of the Mack family under Clan Home. Well, that is really interesting. Not everyone knows all those things about that. We're very blessed to have you here as our sheriff with all this knowledge and, and, and all these things. I, I'm, I think that people will be excited to hear these interesting things. I know it, it, it's interesting to me. Mm -hmm. I know I'm a bit of a nerd, so I don't know if everything <laughs> interests me, it interests other people, but I, I think it's, it's, it's good to have this information available. Well, thank you, Sheriff. This has been a pleasure of My mine. My pleasure. I have learned so much about you and your family and your history, and I am proud to have you here as a citizen of Bowen County and serving the people. Thank you so much. It's a privilege. Thank you.